Thank you all for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. I realize that you had other options, but I'm so happy that you decided to join us today, and I am truly grateful for that. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, since our lives are filled with uh, many times of emptiness, we pray that you will help us to realize uh, that you are the true filler of all of our emptiness. Whatever emptiness we are faced with in the future, we pray that you would fill them in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing the series, Show Me Me. And so far, we have covered the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah. And today we start with chapter six. Uh, our text this morning comes from Isaiah chapter six, verse one. It reads, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. For some time uh, now, the study of God's word has revealed to me that in order for me to truly see the real me, I must view me through the word of God. And we have sat where the Israelites sat and saw them through God's view. And while doing so, we have been given a preview of ourselves and we look uh, uh, into our future with the potential for us to make changes in the way that we live for the better. In other words, we can learn from the Israelites' mistakes. God in, is timeless and can see the past, the present, and the future clearly. He's all-knowing. He's the omniscient one. God already knows everything about us, and one day we will know even as we are known. Isaiah had reigned in our text for about 42 years, during the greater part of which he and his people, the Israelites, had been wonderfully prosperous. Isaiah had led the Israels to be uh, victorious in war and he was also successful in the art of peaceful industry. What Isaiah promised to do as king to the Israelites is exactly what he delivered. Isaiah spoke more than a lot of empty words. Now the latter years of his life were clouded, but on a whole his reign had been a time of great well-being for the Israelites. His son, Uzziah's son and successor, was a young man about 25 years old, and when he came to the throne, gloomy war clouds were gathering in the north and threatening to drift to Judah. No wonder the prophet Isaiah, like others, thoughtful patriots, was asking himself what was to come of these anxious days when the control was in new hands, which perhaps were not strong enough to hold the control. Like a wise man, he took his thoughts into the sanctuary, and there he understood. It was the same as Aesop in, uh, was conveyed in uh, Psalm 73. Aesop was confused about uh, seeing the wicked prosper and the righteous uh, just getting by. But Psalm 73 and 17 says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Verse 18 says, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. And how are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with top ter terror. As he agonized, this great vision was revealed to his inward eye. In the year that King Uzziah died is a great deal more than a date for chronological purposes. It tells us not only the when, but the why of the vision. 
The earthly king was laid in his grave. But the prophet saw that the true king of Israel was neither the dead Uzziah nor the young Jonathan, but the Lord of hosts. And seeing that all fears, apprehensions, anxieties, and the sense of loss all vanished and new strength came to Isaiah. He went into the temple, weighted down with uncertainty and all kinds of uncertain thoughts. But he came out of it with a bouncy step and a lightened heart and the resolve, here am I, send me. There are some lessons that I see that are very important and useful for us in our daily lives as shown in this remarkable vision. It also carries a remarkable note of the time that is connected to it. Let me see if I can say a word or two about the assistance of loss and the sorrow in preparing for the vision. Let me say that again the assistance of loss and the sorrow in preparing for the vision. It was when King Uzziah died that the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. If the throne of Israel had been emptied, Isaiah would not have seen God sitting high and lifted up on his throne in heaven. And so it is with all of our losses, with all of our sorrows, with all of our disappointments and with all of our pains. They have a mission to reveal to us God's throne in heaven. The possession of the things that are taken away from us and the joy which our sorrows beat into the dust have the same mission and the highest purpose of every good, of every blessing, of every possession, of every gladness, of all love. The highest mission is to lead us to him. Is that what our sorrows and our pains and our losses and our disappointments do for us? And, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm talking about the empty throne that is filled. Well, for those to whom the passing of all that can pass is a means of revealing the Lord to us, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The message in this vision to us and of all these our pains and grief is come to up close to us. In them, our Heavenly Father is saying to us, Seek ye my face. Well, for those who answer, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thyself far from me. Let us be careful not to waste our griefs and sorrows. They absorb us sometime with empty regret. It is our griefs and sorrows that embitter us towards rebellious thoughts. They often break the unrealistic ties with the interest in others. But their true intention is to draw back the curtain, the thin curtain, and to show us the things that are the reality of the God that is sitting on his throne. And the skirts that fill the temple and the hovering of the seraphim and the coal from the altar that purges our sins. And then secondly, 
Let me suggest how our text shows us the com compensation, the pay that is given for all losses. As I have pointed out already, the thoughts conveyed by the prophet in this vision was not only the general one of God's sovereign rule, but the special one of his rule over and for and his protection of the orphan kingdom which had lost its king. The vision took the special shape that the moment required. It was because the earthly king was dead that the living king, the heavenly king, was revealed. So there is uh, suggested that the consciousness of God's presence and work for us takes in each heart the precise shape that its momentary necessities and circumstances requires. In other words, then we see that God is our all and all. He's our I am. He's whatever we need. God becomes the infinite fullness of strength that our weakness cries out for. He assumes any form that the dependent creature has a need of. And so the one God will become everything and anything that every man, each man requires. He shapes himself according to our needs. Let me remind you of what I've already insisted on more than once, that the perfecting of this vision is in the historical fact of the incarnated son. Jesus Christ shows us God. He's God with us. Emmanuel. Jesus Christ is the King of glory. Jesus is our rock in a weary land. Jesus is our friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is my very present help in times of trouble. Jesus was David uh, 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 he, he, he was there with Daniel in a lion's den. He, he, he was the three young Hebrew young men in the fiery furnace. He was right there with them. He's a very present help in trouble. He's bread in a starving land. He's water in dry places. Can I tell you about he's my doctor in a sick room? He's my lawyer in a courtroom. Can I tell you his name? He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and the morning star. He's my way out of no way. He's a bridge over troubled waters. He's Adam's redeemer. He's our redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's our vindicator. He was Abraham's sacrificial lamb, and he's our sacrificial lamb. He was Noah's ark, and he's our ark. He's Moses' burning bush, and I declare he is our burning bush. He was Joshua's battle act, Gideon's fleece, and Samson's power. He was David's music, and he was Solomon's wisdom, Jeremiah's bomb and Gilead. He was Ezekiel's will in the middle of a will. He was God's only begotten son. He was Mary's baby boy. He was James and Jude's older brother. He was Matthew's king and Messiah. He was Mark's suffering servant. He was Luke's great physician. He was John's word made flesh. He's our Alpha and our Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's our elder brother. He's our savior. 
And if I was at Mount Sinai in the pulpit, I'd say I'm closing now. And I'm not going to do like I would do then, have about three or four closing. I'm truly closing. But can I tell you why Jesus is all of that to me? He died one Friday on a hill called Calvary. On an old rugged cross, he died. Anybody listening to me know he died? Do you really believe that he died? And then early the third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. When Uzziah's throne was left empty, then Isaiah saw that his throne really was being filled by the God that we serve. And we do well in this day and age to let him fill the throne of our hearts. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for giving us insight of how to handle our losses. Help us to have an awareness of you setting high on your throne, even in our times of emptiness, so that we can see that we can have joy in the midst of sorrow. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for joining us once again. We pray that you've been blessed by this little sermon, and we pray, pray that it will continue to, to help you in your times of needs, uh, that the Holy Spirit will recall it to your memory when you have an emptiness in life. I love you. God loves you. And we'll see you next time. So long.